Um, so, um, I was given the talk, uh, coal seam gas in New South Wales, but actually it's a lot um, more than that. I think we're just looking at the tip of um, uh, what um, we're starting to refer to as a gas bomb, which is um, the massive development of um, unconventional gas of all types um, in Australia at the current time. Um, you see, mm, okay, so the two main messages from this talk that I want you to take away, um, and one is that we really don't need um, and don't want any more gas um, of any description. Um, DA um, holds that there should be no further development of any sort of onshore natural gas in Australia. And the two reasons are because of global heating, um, and also due to local health impacts from the processes that are required to extract that gas. And we're not alone in um, our concerns, um, our concerns which we've been voicing since 2011 um, have also been voiced very adequately um, by, and succinctly by the AMA actually, saying if in doubt turn CSG off, uh, referring to the precautionary principle uh, which should be applied with a uh, relatively new industry such as unconventional gas drilling. But also the Public Health Association of Australia and those other organisations that you say they have been very active in their advocacy over many years, um, trying to bring the concerns, the health concerns of CSG, shale and so on uh, to the attention of our uh, politicians and our policy makers. So what is this thing? Um, uh, there's a picture there on the left of an export terminal being um, built, you know, I think it might be Gladstone, for liquefied natural gas. On the right is a picture of a gas field in south, um, uh, southern Queensland, the Tara gas field. And you're high up in the air there and what you see is a network of roads and then these little well pads. Because unconventional gas is difficult to extract. It holds tightly to its rock formation, whether it be a coal seam, shale, or tight sands, limestone. So what you need to do is pockmark the area with multiple wells, connect those wells, um, drill down, drill horizontally, use hydraulic fracturing, um, which breaks, basically breaks up the rock formation and makes it more easy for the gas to be released. A lot of water is released in the process uh, that water is um, salty, it's full of coal seam uh, contaminants such as heavy metals, radioactive isotopes um, and a lot of salt. So it's a very industrial process, it crisscrosses the land, uh, it disturbs land use patterns um, and it has many uh, potential local sources of air and water pollution, soil contamination, um, not to man mention the cl land clearing as well. Um, that goes on for the infrastructure. In New South Wales, um, we have one coal seam gas field in southwest Sydney uh, run by AGL, which is due to be decommissioned over the next few years. Um, DEA fought very hard to have an expansion, the northern expansion stopped back in 2013, and indeed it was stopped, and many good protections were put in place by um, the incoming um, coalition government that year, uh, setbacks and protections for residential areas, uh, which made that project and many others that were still in the process of development and approval, uh, basically took them off the table. And in fact, the New South Wales government, coalition government, to give them credit, bought back a whole lot of licenses. There were coal seam gas licenses all over the metropolitan Sydney basin, everywhere. In fact, they were gonna drill in St. Peter's um, so, <laughs> and that was part of the very first talk that I, that I gave in 2011. So what have we got left? Um, Gloucester, we stopped. Um, the amazing people of the Northern Rivers, uh, part of New South Wales, stopped um, coal seam gas drilling up there uh, in the, what's now famous Bentley blockade, where the community just rose up and said no, and really the government had no choice. Um, what we have left is an exploratory project in the Pilliga, near the Pilliga State Forest, and that's that little splodge of green that you can see well away from the coast, more or less the centre of that picture. Um, Narrabri, um, the Narrabri Gas Project is run by Santos, it bought it from Eastern Star. Um, there was about 56 exploratory wells, 
Um, Santos had to shut down most of them because they were basically didn't meet industry standards. Um, and I'll tell you um, a little bit about this project um, through the talk just to give you some examples of um, the way things turn out with unconventional gas. So basically, um, we want very much to stop this one going ahead because it could be the thin end of the wedge in New South Wales. Um, and um, it's been, it still hasn't had its final approvals. Um, I think there's a planning assessment commission coming up. I'm looking at Kate, you might know. Um, I don't think a date has even been announced for that. So our, our concerns and our advocacy over this joining together with many other green groups um, has worked so far to delay it, you'll be pleased to know. But that, was going, that is going to be 850 coal seam gas wells through the Pilliga State Forest, through surrounding farmland, uh, and there's a lot of opposition to it locally, as you can imagine. Uh, it's right over the southern recharge of the Great Artesian Basin, um, and I'm sure I don't need to tell you how important that is for agriculture in Australia. So, um, how does it? How does unconventional natural gas development erode um, health? Would it does it through the environmental determinants of health, which are the biggest things that hold our health? If you think of the centre of that diagram being our own genetics, our own lifestyle, where we live, our socio-economic factors, moving out um, of the centre of that circle, you come to environmental factors, and the biggies are clean air, clean water, a stable climate. Um, nature, obviously, and um, safe food. So I'm just going to go through the climate impacts first, because I think these are probably, these are the things that keep me awake at night, all right? The local health impacts are horrible, but this is the, this is the one that um, is most concerning. There's a lot said about how grass is so great and it's so clean and it's so cheap. You've all heard this, right? Um, and really our state and national governments do believe that it's an important transitional fuel as we move to a low emissions economy. And they think that it can be made safe for the local communities um, and that it, it's overall a force for good um, in our current situation. And it was named a transition fuel because when you burn it, it produces only half the CO2 emissions that um, coal does at the point of combustion. But you have to take into consideration all the emissions that go into actually producing it, drilling it, exploring it, producing it, mopping up the waste, and so on. And if you're going to export it, you have to liquefy it, which is an energy to intense operation, and then you have to regas it at the other end. So when you take the whole life cycle, there's only a very marginal, um, uh, only a very marginal benefit in terms of lower CO2 emissions when you burn it. So it's also a costly fuel. We're actually paying in the eastern half of Australia twice what they pay in WA for their gas. We're also paying more than what the international price is for gas these days. Um, and it's actually not a very pro profitable industry. When you look at the industry in the United States and Canada, and also here, there have been very large write-downs. Um, there's a whole coal seam gas field in Queensland that didn't end up being built because it just wasn't profitable. So it's actually expensive to extract um, coal seam and unconventional gas. Uh, natural gas, of course, is methane. It's just that little molecule there, very um, innocuous looking thing, but it's actually um, one of the climate forces. So over a 20 year time span, it's 86 times more potent a greenhouse gas than CO2. So it's often accounted for in terms of its 100 um, year time span where it's 20 times, but actually it's the next 20 years that are going to make or break our efforts to stabilise our climate. And when you look at, the, look at the whole lifestyle and you look at it burnt for power, you only need to lose a tiny fraction of that gas as what they call fugitive emissions, that's methane just venting straight into the atmosphere to completely wipe out any benefit that it has over coal. Far from being a transition fuel, it's probably a just a massive distraction. Uh, in fact, these are very conservative figures because in the US um, estimates are that between and 2 and 17% sometimes of the gas escapes as fugitive emissions. 
So this is why we're now referring it to the as it, uh, to it as the gas bomb. Um, atmospheric methane has had taken a sharp up, uptick uh, since about 2006, and it accounts for up to 25% of our heat trapping at the moment. Oil and gas production is responsible for up to three quarters of the methane that humans produce. So it's really very significant. And Australia is on the cusp of a massive expansion in conventional and unconventional gas extraction with large developments in the Northern Territory, WA, Queensland, and potentially here, um, if, we, um, uh, if the New South Wales government goes in that direction. We're also on track, if not already, the world's number one LNG exporter, producing about a fifth of the supply internationally. So Australia's emissions currently are 5% of global emissions, if you include our fossil fuel exports. So that's, 20, that's one in 20, <laughs> that's one twentieth of the whole entire problem of climate change is just from Australia. It's just mind blowing. Um, considering uh, we're a small country with a low population. So, um, but current developments on the table um, here in Australia could increase that to a proportion of up to 17% of global emissions <coughs> by 2030. And a fair bit of that is gas. So there's abundant LNG flooding an international market and actually displacing renewables. This is why this is not a transitional fuel. It's not a bridge. It's, it's a distraction. It's actually delaying the transition that we need. In fact, total fossil fuel use in the USA that has done the most unconventional gas drilling is that has actually hasn't changed. They've just shifted it from coal to gas. Fugitive emissions are routinely underestimated or they're not measured at all and they're, and they're not regulated. And this is um, just um, outstanding. I mean, uh, unbelievable. <laughs> I can't believe that. Anyway, um, in Australia there, um, according to um, a review by um, some academics at, I think it's University of Melbourne, there's been no comprehensive rigorous or uh, and independently verifiable audit of gas emissions in Australia either, and yet we're forging right on out there. So the spin that the fossil fuel companies have given us that gas is green and clean has totally convinced our political um, system. And uh, we have to work very hard against that myth. Uh, delays action on greenhouse gas reduction and it's gonna make it impossible for us uh, in Australia to meet our climate target um, of limited warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, and yeah, it does keep me awake at night, I have to say. It should keep us all awake at night. So in terms of the local health impact, they're mediated through water um, and air, largely. Um, I'm gonna zip through a few slides here. Um, these are all the concerns that DEA has been voicing for the last eight years that are in countless submissions. And um, we've recently uh, published a position, not a position statement. Um, it's an oil and gas um, paper that's been, that really summarises the current literature beautifully. Um, and I think John's got a few copies of a, an executive summary that are on the front desk. Have a look. It's an incredible amount of work. Um, and um, it really goes through these highly complex concerns in great detail and represents the current state of evidence. So um, we have a national chemical regulator. A lot of chemicals are involved in this process. You use them for fracking fluids, you use them for drilling, you release them from the coal seam. Um, the ones that have been voluntarily surrendered for assessment by the companies, because they say it's commercial and confidence, have been uh, assessed by, by this government body and um, there are plenty that are harmful um, and there's plenty that they don't know. And who knows how many other chemicals have been used since 2012. There's no routine disclosure, it's not mandatory, and there's no routine assessment. So these are some that uh, are in the Santos EIS. Um, they're irritants, they're toxic. Um, they're not what you'd want um, you know, in your backyard. 
um, waste water has got a lot of stuff in it um, and there's a lot of it. You have to take the water out before the gas flows and then you've got this um, plenty of this very salty fluid that you have to work out uh, what you do with it and you put it in a holding pond that's lined with builder's plastic and you hope that the plastic doesn't uh, tear um, and uh, you hope that it's not spilled or you spray it on roads to control the dust um, and, or you put it through a reverse osmosis plant if you've got some money uh, which removes 90% of the water um, which can be then used for beneficial use but then you've got this salty sludge that has to be heated dried into a salt that is not the salt that you can use on the table because it's full of heavy metals, BTEX and whatnot, um, and then you have to find somewhere to put the salt. That Narrabri gas project um, in full operation will produce two and a half B double trucks per day of that salt. Where do you put it? They haven't actually explained where they're going to put it. Um, <laughs> Queensland CSG um, is going to produce 31 million tonnes of salt over 30 years and that's enough to fill the MCG 15 times to the brim with salt. In a dry um, land that struggles with salination, that's a real concern and you can see why farmers hate this shit. Stop it, sorry. <laughs> um, so, and we also spill stuff around when we're doing the industry. So. Um, U.S. spill rates based on tens of thousands of wells that they have going there mean that between 15 to 130 spills of wastewater uh, can be expected in the Narrabri gas project. However, even in the development exploration phase of 50 wells, there have been multiple spills and some of them quite significant. Some have killed vegetation. Uh, and they've had been fined multiple times by the New South Wales government. An aquifer became contaminated um, because uh, wastewater leaking out um, of a holding pond got into the soil and that mobilised some of the natural soil components into an aquifer and um, they found uranium many times the safe drinking water guideline in that aquifer in the Pilliga State Forest. And that's a mechanism that nobody had even thought of. So, um, it, no, it was the salt in the wastewater that mobilised these components out of the soil and into the aquifer. So, strange things happen with this industry. Um, a lot of, probably about half the health impacts are going to happen through air pollution, volatile organic compounds. We've just heard all about um, these sorts of elements from Ben. Um, and they come off um, from, with the fugitive emissions, from the drilling fluids, the fracking fluids, the flow back, the wastewater and so on. Then you've got multiple um, truck um, movements, you've got diesel machinery with the drilling, um, uh, you get a lot of ground level ozone, um, you've got gas fields in rural parts of Utah and Wyoming that have got worse air quality and more ozone than LA. Um, that's from uh, 12 months from the current Narrabri gas facility, um, that's from our National Pollution Inventory. So in terms of actual, um, what we've studied of people's health, um, back into even 2014, um, there were no comprehensive population-based studies of public health effects from this industry. Um, we've had some you know, exploratory articles in the MJA, uh, really urging the precautionary principle um, uh, talking about the overseas experience and urging caution. But in the last five, six years, um, and exponentially, there's been a growing body of literature actually studying health of people who've had to live in these gas fields, mostly from overseas, mostly from um, the United States. And the evidence is incomplete, but what is there is extremely concerning. Um, there's a few papers there, I'm not going to go into those, but um, they're all available and they're all in this um, amazing document that my colleagues put together. Um, so silica exposure is a major problem for fracking, leaves a lot of sand, it gets into the air, it gets into the workers' lungs. There's chemicals um, in use for fracking and um, drilling that have got carcinogenic potential that are endocrine disruptors which means if they get into the environment and if the exposure is even very, very low, um, they can affect the 
fertility that can affect the growth of an unborn child and so on. Um, air pollution um, from these developments can increase asthma, respiratory disease, cancer risk, you can get skin and respiratory conditions and this has been documented um, to occur um, with greater frequency the closer you are to an active well. Um, and then there's the low birth weight, small for gestational age, high frequency of preterm um, birth, uh, birth defects as well that are increasingly and very concerningly being documented. Um, and there's also social and mental health consequences that can begin even when the development is first proposed for a community. You can get community division, you can get people who oppose versus people who support, you can get um, uh, people starting to worry about their livelihood. It can be one of the major factors determining a farmer's health, um, and that's been studied in Australia and Queensland. And if you're in, from an indigenous community and you live so close to the land, um, uh, you're at even greater risk um, of mental and spiritual um, suffering due to the, um, the uh, proposed development and to, to the development itself. And um, when I was up in Narragai this time last year with John, um, we were part of a, we spoke as part of a forum and um, there were some local Indigenous people who came in towards the, to the end of the forum and they spoke very eloquently of the impacts that they've already experienced in their local area um, because of Santos's exploratory project. So um, just to conclude, um, we understand the harms well enough to know that further expansion of gas development will severely harm human health and well-being into the future through exacerbating global heating and through local health impacts. And it's time to defuse the gas bomb. We neither need nor have time for this transition fuel. Thank you.